Hello. Welcome to the Black Mass. We've been hoping you join us tonight. There's plenty of room in our establishment for everyone. Um, I see that most of you are standing in the outer darkness, along the walls, in the corners. Well and good. Um, but our inner circle, our chain of empathy, is not yet complete. Twelve is such an even number. Uh, we need just one more. Won't someone volunteer? Come on. It's only in spirit. <laughs> ah, yes. You'll do nicely. Right here. On my left. Now, we are all set. Tonight, a little something for everyone. As we bring you six little tales by Lord Dunsany. In the order of their appearance, first, a nightmare. Brought on by an overdose of lobster salad. Then, the workman. A moral for those who care enough to throw the first stone. Next, have your flask ready for the charm against thirst. This will be followed by an eyewitness report on how the enemy came upon Tlunrana, an enemy destined for all our inner sanctum. And finally, our favorite oarsman, Charon, and a situation he was bound to run into sooner or later. We saved this one, specially for the end. <laughs> Here now, six little tales by Lord Dunsany. I was climbing, climbing round the perilous outside of the palace of Colconombros. Oh, oh, so far below me that in the tranquil twilight and clear air of those lands, I could only barely see them, lay the craggy tops of the mountains. It was along no battlements or terrace edge I was climbing, but on the sheer face of the wall itself, getting what foothold I could where the, where the boulders joined. Uh, had my feet been bare, I was done. But though I was in my nightshirt, I had on stout leather boots, and, and their edges somehow held in those narrow cracks. No, oh, my, my fingers and wrists were aching. Oh, had it been possible to stop for a moment, I might have been lured to give a second look at the fearful peaks of the mountains down there in the twilight. Oh, and this would have been fatal. Uh, that the thing was all in a dream is beside the point. We have fallen in dreams before. Uh, but it is well known that if in one of those falls you ever hit the ground, uh, you die. Uh, I had looked at those menacing mountain tops below me. 
and knew well that such a fall as the one I feared would have such a termination. Uh, then I went on. Uh, oh, it, it is strange what different sensations there can be in different boulders. When your life depends on the edges of everyone you come to. Those edges seemed strangely different. It was of no avail to overcome the terror of one, for the next would give you a hold in quite a different way, or hand you over to death in a different manner. Some were too sharp to hold, and some too flush with the wall. Those whose hold was the best crumbled the soonest, each rock had its different terror. Uh, and then... Then there were those things that followed behind me. Uh, and at last I came to a breach made long ago by an earthquake. Or lightning, or war. Uh, I should have had to go down a thousand feet to get round it. Uh, and they, they would have reached me while I was doing that. Uh, for certain sable apes, apes, things that had tigerish teeth and were born and bred on that wall had pursued me all the evening. In any case, I could have gone no further. Nor did I know what the king would do whose wall I was climbing. Oh, it was time to drop and be done with it. Or oh, stop and await those apes. And then it was that I remembered a pin. A pin. A pin that I had thrown carelessly down out of an evening tie in another world to the one where grew that glittering wall. Oh, the pin. It was lying now, if no evil chance had removed it, uh, on the chest of drawers beside my bed. Uh, the apes were very close and hurrying, for they knew my fingers were slipping and the cruel peaks of those infernal mountains seemed surer of me than the apes. Uh, uh, finally, finally I, I reached out with a desperate effort of will towards the other world where the pin lay on the chest of drawers. Uh, uh, I groped about. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, ah, I found it, I found it, I found it. Uh, uh, and before the beasts could reach me, I grabbed the pin and uh, uh, I, I ran it through my arm. Saved. Saved. Oh, saved. I saw the workman fall with his scaffolding right from the summit of that hotel. As he came down, I saw him holding a knife and trying to cut his name on the scaffold. He had time to try to do this, for he must have had nearly 300 feet to fall. And I could think of nothing but his folly in doing this futile thing. For not only would the man be unrecognizably dead in three seconds, but the very pole on which he tried to scratch as much of his name as he had time for was certain to be burnt in a few weeks for firewood. Futility. Futility. Then I went home, for I had work to do, and all that evening I thought of the man's folly. 
till the thought hindered me from serious work. And late that night, while I was still at work, a ghost, the ghost of the workman, floated through my wall and stood before me laughing. I could see the grey diaphanous form standing before me, shuddering with laughter. You, workman, ghost, why are you laughing? What are you laughing at? <laughs> Why, I'm a-laughing at you, sitting and working there. <laughs> but why? Why do you laugh at serious work? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why, your blooming life will go by like a wind. And your old silly civilization will be tidied up in a few centuries. <laughs> Futility. <laughs> Futility. <laughs> then, still laughing, he faded back through the wall again and into the eternity from which he had come. Summer, after many delays, had come at last to London, and the heat beat back from the walls and pavements so that the streets were baking. Just after lunch, when it seemed about at its hottest, I was walking down the Strand, going eastwards, when whom should I see, far off in the clear, bright air, but Jorkins coming towards me. Instead of any sign of recognition, he pulled out the end of his watch chain and began absently swinging it. As we drew nearer, I saw something blue on the watch chain, some sort of charm flashing round and round. When we were within a yard of each other, his eyes were still far from me. Hello, Mr. Jorkins. Uh, well, uh, hello there. Uh, out for a walk? Uh, quite true, quite true. Um, that's just what I'm out for. The charm now hung still at the end of the watch chain. I, I looked at it, a little wavy thing, all blue and shiny, hard stone, but all cut into ripples, and blue, 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 right down into the deeps of it. It wasn't turquoise. It was too opaque for a gem. I don't know what it was, but I never saw any little ornament that so set you thinking of water. Ah, ever seen one of these? No, what is it? Uh, well... It's a charm. No, oh, what does it do? Oh, it doesn't do anything very much. It keeps you from dying of thirst. I find it handy now and then. <laughs> well, it's handy on a day such as this anyway. And luck's already with us. There's Moltanos. Come in with me and tell me all about it. For there's one thing about Jorkins, and that is that he'll always tell you a story, whether you believe it or not, it's your own affair, but he's always good for a story. And another thing about him is that he likes to be offered... A drink. Uh, well, uh, the trouble about thirst is that you never know when it's going to catch you. Uh, I don't very often want a drink, but when I do... Oh, on a day like this, I should think we all want a drink. <laughs> what shall we have, Mr. Jorkins? Well, on a day like this, um, uh, I should think um, the whiskey and soda. Whiskey and soda? Well, I expect you're probably right. And I ordered two whiskies and sodas. We sat down... And they arrived. Uh, uh, you were telling me about that spell. Uh, yes, yes, it's a, a curious thing. But it works, you know. Always did. Oh, does it really? I mean, have you have you had it long? Yes, yes, quite a while. Um, I had it from a friend. Uh, he died. Died practically penniless. Uh, and left me his odds and ends. I came by it that way. He didn't die of thirst, then? Uh, no, no, not of thirst. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It, it was very curious uh, that he didn't die of thirst. The whole scene was set up for it. Uh, uh, whatever fates were guiding him uh, must have meant him to die of thirst. Uh, but in the end, the charm was too strong for him. Yes, it works. Damn it, it works. Where did he get it? Uh, from a witch. 
Uh, in Africa, long way up the Nile, where they worship witches. Uh, and my friend uh, Blanders, his name, uh, bought this one because he was going northwards for a long trip in the Sahara. Mm. Yeah, he'd been there before, uh, and thirst was what he was afraid of. Um, uh, the witch had a lot of charms for various purposes, uh, uh, against drowning, uh, uh, being eaten by crocodiles, uh, but it was thirst he was afraid of. Uh, poor Blanders. What happened to him, then? Uh, well, uh, he went in from the north, um, uh, took a few camels and men, as he'd done before, uh, and went in as far as he could, and then turned round and came back again merely seeing how far it could go with, with very little to drink. Uh, that was what it amounted to. M might have played that game anywhere. Uh, but playing it with the Sahara was like teasing a dog till it bit you. No, teasing a tiger, I should say. Uh, only he had such infernal trust in this damned blue stone. And I can't deny it was justified. Well... He gets six camels and, I think, five Arabs and starts one day from El Cantara. He went south for weeks until the Arabs would go no farther. Simply wasn't enough water. And it was then that Blanders told them about his charm. One of those Arabs it was that told me about it later. They all looked at the blue stone and were enormously impressed. And for the next few days, uh, they went on merrily. In fact, they remained in high spirits right up to the time uh, that their camels began to die. Uh, after that, uh, when only two camels were left, and only as much water as each man had in a bottle, and there were a hundred miles still to go, no man of any sense would have believed in a charm against thirst. Uh, and nobody did but blanders. <clears throat> uh, uh, the camels very soon died, and the last drop of water was gone when they were still fifty miles from the mountains. Uh, uh, the next day they began to see the tips of the crags, and the sight hardened them. Uh, they were sure of water there. Old storms have filled those mountains with water courses and cut them far out into the desert. Uh, uh, that day uh, they did thirty miles the next morning, with only twenty miles to go, uh, they saw black rain clouds heavy along the mountains. Uh, they heard the thunder from the storm that was lashing those peaks, but not a drop fell in the desert. Uh, the storm was moving away into the interior of the mountains. Uh, the first slope they came to would have water in abundance, uh, but that comforted Bland as little. Uh, and yet he clung still with the same queer, blind faith in the blue stone. Uh, he, he would have laid down and died hours earlier had it not been for this hope that he got from the stone. Uh, uh, but after struggling on a little farther, uh, he finally gave up ten miles from the mountains. Um, they had got amongst the ravines, at least the steep, dry, rocky beds of lost streams. Here, uh, they could no longer go straight. Uh, a walk over the flat Sahara was one thing for a man to do on hope and hope alone. Uh, but that rough walking uh, was beyond Blander's powers. Uh, uh, he urged the Arabs to go on if they wanted. Uh, he would stay there and dig there had certainly been water once in the very spot where he had fallen. It was a riverbed ten feet deep uh, with huge boulders in it that had been smoothed and rounded uh, like marbles by some old torrent. He began to dig in a patch of sand with his knife. Uh, the Arabs neither left him nor helped but sat and watched him from the bank. <sighs> there was Blanders digging with a knife and only this, this here blue stone between him and the knowledge of that death from thirst was certain. Uh, there was not a flicker of hope in the faces of the Arabs. They were as parched as he, and the thunder from the storm in the mountains 
was rolling farther and farther off. Um, uh, then suddenly, uh, the Arab shouted. Um, uh, Blanders looked up and did not understand. But it would have been too late anyway. Uh, there never is time on those occasions when the storms send down the rivers that make those watercourses. It came down round the corner, the old river, the rightful possessor of that watercourse, rolling the boulders along with it like a boy playing marbles. And Blanders. Uh, Blanders was swept away for over a mile and round his neck on its chain when they found his body lay that triumphant amulet. Drowned! Drowned. Uh, he could have had a charm against drowning for the same price. Uh, but one never knows what's in store. That's the way of those charms. Well, uh, anyway, it's, it's not treating you like that. Uh, 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 you think because it got me a drink uh, that it is not packed as full of curses uh, as an African witch can do it. Uh, they're all the same. All those charms and spells that promise you so much. All the same. Uh, what has it done for me? Uh, all that it promises. And then it gets level just as it did with Blanders. Uh, it's the same with all these bargains. Always was. Man is always outwitted. Uh, it'll take me the same way as Blanders. Slower, that's all. What is time to these ancient devilries? I hardly knew what to say. I was turning over a few phrases, all equally lame, when Jorgen suddenly smiled. Uh, uh, well, we've got on to a pretty gloomy topic, uh, uh, haven't we? I cannot claim to be a tactful person, and yet sometimes an inner feeling tells me the right thing to do without knowing at all why. It prompted me now. Well, have another drink, anyway. Have another drink. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I will. It had been prophesied of old and foreseen from the ancient days that its enemy would come upon Tlunrana. And the date of its doom was known, and the gate by which it would enter. Yet none had prophesied of the enemy who he was, save that he was of the gods, though he dwelt with men. Meanwhile, Tlunrana, that secret lamasery, that chief cathedral of wizardry, was the terror of the valley in which it stood, and of all the lands round about it. So narrow and high were the windows, and so strange when lighted at night, that they seemed to regard men with the demonic leer of something that had a secret in the dark. Who were the magicians, and the deputy magicians, and the great arch-wizard of that furtive place? Nobody knew, for they went veiled and hooded and cloaked, completely in black. Though her doom was close upon her, and the enemy of prophecy should come that very night through the open southward door that was named the gate of the doom. Yet, that rocky edifice, Tlunrana, remained mysterious still, venerable, terrible, dark, and dreadfully crowned with her doom.
It was not often that anyone dared wander near to Tlunrana by night. When the moan of the magicians invoking we know not whom rose faintly from inner chambers, scaring the drifting bats. But on the last night of all, the man from the black thatched cottage by the five pine trees came because he would see Tlunrana once again before the enemy that was divine but that dwelt with man should come up against it and it should be no more. Up the dark valley he went like a bold man but his fears were thick upon him. His bravery bore their weight but stood a little beneath them. He went in at the southward gate that is named the Gate of Doom. He came into a dark hall and passed up a marble stairway to see the last of Tlunrana. At the top, a curtain of black velvet hung, and he passed into a chamber heavily hung with curtains, with a gloom in it that was blacker than anything they could account for. In a somber chamber beyond, Seen through a vacant archway, magicians with lighter tapers plied their wizardry and whispered incantations. All the rats in the place were passing away, going whimpering down the stairway. The man from the black thatched cottage passed through that second chamber. The magicians did not look at him and did not cease their incantations. He passed from them through heavy curtains still of black velvet and came into a chamber of black marble where nothing stirred. Only one taper burned in the third chamber. There were no windows. On the smooth floor and under the smooth wall a silk pavilion stood with its curtains drawn close together. This was the Holy of Holies of that ominous place, its inner mystery. One on each side of it, dark figures crouched, either of men or women, or cloaked stone, or of beasts trained to be silent. When the awful stillness of the mystery was more than he could bear, the man from the black-thatched cottage by the five pine trees went up to the silk pavilion and with a bold and nervous clutch of the hand drew one of the curtains aside. And saw the inner mystery. And laughed. And the prophecy was fulfilled, and Tlunrana was never more a terror to the valley. But the magicians passed away from their terrible halls and fled through the open fields, wailing and beating their breasts. For laughter was the enemy that was doomed to come against Tlunrana through her southward gate that was named the Gate of Doom. For laughter is of the gods, but dwells with man. saw last night the queenly Vava Nelia, though partly she was hidden by great clouds that swept continually by her, rolling over and over. Yet her face was unhidden and shone, being full of moonlight. Vava Nelia, walk with me. Walk. 
walk by the great pools in many gardens, beautiful Istrakhan, where the lilies float that give delectable dreams. Drawing aside the curtain of hanging orchids, pass with me thence from the pools by a secret path through the jungle that fills the only way between the mountains that shut in Istrakhan. The mountains shut it in, and look on it with joy at morning and at evening when the pools are strange with light, till in their gladness sometimes there melts the deadly snow that kills upon lonely heights. The mountaineer. They have valleys among them, older than the wrinkles of the moon. Oh, Vavanie, come with me then, or linger with me there, and either we shall come to romantic lands which the men of the caravan speak of only in song, or else we shall listlessly walk in a land so lovely that even the butterflies that float about it. When they see their images flash in the sacred pools, are terrified by their beauty. And each night we shall hear the myriad nightingales, all in one chorus, sing the stars to death. Oh, do this, Vavanie, and I will send heralds far from here with tidings of thy beauty, and they shall run and come to Sendara, and men shall know it there who heard brown sheep. And from Sendara, the rumor shall spread on down either bank of the holy river of Zorth, till the peoples that make wattles in the plain shall hear of it and sing. But the heralds shall go northward along the hills until they come to Suma, and in that golden city they shall tell the kings, the kings that sit in their lofty alabaster house, of thy strange and sudden smile. And often in distant markets shall thy story be told by merchants out from Suma, as they sit telling careless tales to lure men to their wares. And the heralds passing hence shall come even to Ingra, to Ingra where they dance. And there they shall tell of thee, so that thy name, long hence, shall be sung in that joyous city. And there they shall borrow camels and pass over the sands and go by desert ways to distant near it, to near it, to tell of thee to the lonely men in the mountain monastery. Oh, Vavanir, Vavanir, come with me even now, come with me now, for it is spring, spring. And, and as I said this, she faintly, yet perceptibly, shook her head. And it was only then, only then, I remembered my youth was gone, and she. Dead, dead, forty years. Oh, the 
heaviness. Ah, oh, the pain in my arms. A part of a scheme made by the gods. And all of a piece with eternity. Ah. Uh, Karen leaned forward and wrote. If the gods had sent him a contrary wind, it would have divided all time in his memory into two equal slaps. So grey were all things always where he was, that if any radiance lingered a moment among the dead, on the face of such a queen perhaps as Cleopatra, his eyes could not have perceived it. Oh, all things one uh, with my weariness. Uh, uh. It was strange that the dead nowadays were coming in such numbers. They were coming in thousands where they used to come in fifties. It was neither Karen's duty nor his want to ponder in his grey soul why these things may be. Karen leaned forward and rode. Then no one came for a while. It wasn't usual for the guard to send no one down from earth for such a space. But the gods knew best. One man finally came, alone. The ghost sat shivering on a lonely bench, and the great boat pushed off. Uh, uh, only one passenger. Only one. Well... Well, the gods know best. Uh, 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 the gods know best. And the great and weary Karen rode on and on beside his passenger. The sound of the river was like a mighty sigh that grief in the beginning had sighed among her sisters, and it couldn't die like the echoes of human sorrow failing on earthly hills, but was as old as time and the pain in Karen's arms. Then the boat from the slow grey river loomed up to the coast of Dis, and the silent ghost, still shivering, stepped ashore and Karen turned the boat to go wearily back to the world. Wait. 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 I can't wait. I must go back to the world. Wait. I am the last. I am the last one. The last. The last. The last. Well, well, the gods know best. The gods know best. No one had ever made Karen smile before. No one before had ever made him weep.
thought you'd better stand by, Karen. Just in case. And now, for those of you who are left, it's time to break up our little gathering for this evening. We'll meet again real soon. Join us, wherever you are. Bring a friend. <laughs> Good night.